culture. Super Bowl MVP Patrick Mahomes tells us how high school hoops helped shape his football career. As we welcome you to NFL Live on a Monday, Hannah Storm, along with Dan Graziano, Mike Tannenbaum, Sam Acho, Micah Parsons is keeping the Cowboys in the news, fellas. He had quite the weekend at the NBA All-Star Game. As we just mentioned, he was MVP in the Celebrity Game. We're going to have highlights of that coming up. He also joined Stephen A. on his show, responding to Demarcus Lawrence's comments that the Cowboys were tired in that postseason loss to the Packers. You should never go into a game like I'm tired, like I'm ready, like I'm ready to go home. Cause that's exactly what happened, and it did happen. I'm coming to the game every week, like, man, I got four more weeks left. I don't know what y'all got, but I got four more weeks left. Like, that's part of the culture and identity that I just feel like we're missing. Like, that I would like. That's just something like I don't agree with at all. Like, regular season, ah, right, yeah, I'm tired. Like, I'm wore out. But as soon as playoffs hit, knowing how limited and how hard it is to win in playoff game, I would, I would, I would never say I'm tired or. I, I feel fatigued because that's my job to not feel that way. Acho, let's start with you. What do you think about what Micah had to say? Well, he's talking about culture. I think Michael Parsons is coming from a place at Penn State where he used to win a lot, he used to be the best player on the field. Now he's in the NFL, still oftentimes the best player on the field, winning in the regular season, but playoff comes and all of a sudden you hear conversations like, man, we were tired, or man, maybe we got out schemed, or for whatever reason we didn't come prepared. But Michael Parsons is, if not the leader, one of the leaders on this team. And so part of what being a great leader is, people call it level five leadership, it's not just leading yourself. It's not just you being the best. It's you having other guys around you, bringing them up to your level as well, right? Talking about penalties and accountability. Michael Parsons was one of the most penalized guys on the Cowboys. Tied for fourth penal most penalized on the team, right? Okay, Sam Williams, another defensive end, another penalized guy. Bring him under your wing. Help him become a better leader, not just in the regular season, but also get with him in the offseason. I got a chance to see Patrick Mahomes in the offseason working out with guys like Sky Moore, other guys on his team, other players, you know, backup quarterbacks. Like, they're all together. And so, yes, Michael Parsons is an elite talent and an elite leader, but the best leaders not just lead themselves. You have to find ways to motivate others. Going back to Mahomes again, to that comment that he made, I think it was early in the season, there was an overthrown pass, I believe it was to Marquez Valdez-Scantling, and it wasn't even overthrown. It was actually a perfect pass, but Mahomes said, man, I could have put it a little bit shorter. And fast forward, what does that do? That boosts the confidence of your teammates. That shows accountability for you, and all of a sudden they have to get to your level. And so for me, I think the change that Michael Parsons wants to see, it has to to start with him, and not just him alone, him bringing other guys alongside with him to bring them up to his level. That's, that's an outstanding uh, advertisement for your book that you got behind you over your right shoulder there, Sacho. Change starts with you. <laughs> You're talking to Michael Parsons. I think that's fantastic synergy uh, here on the program, but I agree completely. I'm listening to Michael Parsons talk, and I'm thinking, why is he saying this to Stephen A. Smith? I mean, good for Stephen A., you know, good content for his, his podcast and all, but it feels like if Micah Parsons feels this way, he needs to find a way not just to say it, but to deliver it effectively in his own locker room, right? So at 24 years old, he's an elite player. He's done things in his first three years in the league that, that are beyond what, what a lot of people do in their whole careers. He doesn't really need to improve as a player, although, you know, everybody's always working to do that. It seems like if Micah Parsons want to help, wants to help elevate the Cowboys, this is the arena in which there's room for him to operate and room for him to grow. So I absolutely agree with, uh, with Sacho there that, you know, there, that if there is a leadership vacuum in the Cowboys locker room and from the outside it sometimes appears as if there might be, then Micah Parsons, certainly because of the kind of player he is, has the capacity and, and the juice, if you will, to, to go in and fill that. And, uh, and I think that would be a, a wise move at this point. You know, Hannah, I agree with what uh, both Graz and Sam said, which is the most effective type of leadership is player-led leadership. The best teams I was on, player-led leadership, like the Bart Scotts of the world, they solve problems. And that's exactly what the Cowboys need. They need player-led leadership to solve problems, and they need some force multipliers get guys there for the off-season program, stay longer in the facility. And I'll give you two names, Hannah. Someone like a Bobby Wagner or a Levante David. They need a middle linebacker, assuming that Leighton Vanderish won't be back, who could be a single caller but also a leader because this team has plenty of talent, but year in and year out we see them fall short at consequential times, 
and hopefully these intangibles where they can improve upon will get them to where they want to go. Yeah, leading by example, actually the most powerful uh, stop in that talk and uh, getting it done. Maybe they need some help in that regard. Okay, starting tomorrow, teams can put the franchise tag on some key players around the NFL. There are plenty of important decisions to be made this season, the likes of Saquon Barkley, T. Higgins, Baker Mayfield. Dan, let's start there in Tampa. They really have some tough decisions to make among three of their stars, actually. What do we need to know heading into tomorrow? Well, I think sometimes how this comes down to the cost. And Baker Mayfield, the quarterback, would cost about $36 million for the Buccaneers to franchise, uh, which makes it, I think, unlikely that they do that. More likely that they try and work out a long-term deal with him or explore other options on the quarterback market, much the way they did last year when they landed on Baker Mayfield. So look for the Bucs to try and keep Baker, but probably not franchise him. And I could say the same thing about wide receiver Mike Evans. Because of the rules of how the franchise tags are calculated and how much money Evans made on his previous contract, his franchise tag would be over $28 million uh, if the Buccaneers decided to use it on him. That's significantly more than the wide receiver franchise tag uh, would normally be, uh, again, for reasons tied to his previous uh, contract. Look at safety Antoine Winfield uh, and about a $16 million tag as the more likely candidate for Tampa Bay. The Cincinnati Bengals have T. Higgins eligible for free agency. He is a strong candidate for the franchise tag as the Bengals work to keep the group around Joe Burrow together as long as possible before Burrow's cap numbers start going up significantly in future years. Higgins would love a contract extension, and it's possible the Bengals find a way to give him one. But if they can't, I would, be, I would expect them to franchise him to make sure he doesn't leave the building. And you will not see the Vikings use the franchise tag on quarterback Kirk Cousins. That's because his deal does not void until right before the league year which is after the deadline for franchising players that's a little trick that uh, got put in the contract to make sure they couldn't franchise him the vikings will spend the next couple weeks trying to work out a long-term deal with cousins if they can't they'll move on that could mean the draft it could mean another option in free agency but then cousins would be a free agent and free to sign anywhere else could be an option for Tampa Bay or Atlanta or Vegas or any of those teams that are looking for quarterbacks. And it certainly bears remembering how well he was playing before he tore his Achilles in Week 8. Cousins had some of the best numbers in the NFL. He was tied with Tua Tungabailoa for the most touchdowns in the NFL, and he was second to Tua at that point in passing yards. So, Mike T., let's put your GM hat back on. What would you do with Kirk Cousins also knowing that you have Justin Jefferson's contract to worry about? Hannah, you have to get him signed to an extension. And as we talked about before the show, give him a big signing bonus, prorate it out to lower the cap number. Look, he's 36 years old. That's not ideal. But when you juxtapose his performance, which you just laid out, compare it with the 11th pick, which is likely somebody like J.J. McCarthy or maybe Bo Nix from Oregon, clearly Kirk Cousins is the better player. The big three of Jaden Daniels. Drake Bay and Caleb Williams will be long gone. So I think the Vikings would be well served to hold on to Justin Jefferson and Kirk Cousins, give them long-term deals, and that's their nucleus going forward. Clearly, that's their best option. If not, I think Kirk Cousins looks at Atlanta, he looks at Pittsburgh, and I think he'll be gone really quick despite the injury because he's been so productive. Yeah, I, don't th I don't think there's even any need or reason for Kirk Cousins to look anywhere outside of Minnesota, especially if they'll have him back. I mean, think about the I think about the competence that he has at receiver. Yes, you talk about Justin Jefferson, one of the most prolific receivers in the entire NFL, but then also young players like Jordan Addison had 10 touchdowns this last season. So when it comes to competence, when it comes to confidence, when it comes to culture, it seems as if Kirk Cousins has it all here in Minnesota. Then on the flip side of that, Minnesota may say, okay, well, maybe we go get a guy in, in the draft or maybe we try and figure out a young quarterback and clear some cap space. But why would you want to do that when you know you're going to have a good defense led by Brian Flores and right. you know you also have those competent and dominant receivers, especially with Justin Jefferson, if you can sign him to a long-term deal. And so for me, I don't think this is a situation where you want to look to the draft to, the draft to get a quarterback. You have your quarterback who's putting up not only best numbers around the league, those were career numbers for Kirk Cousins to, the, to that point. Play day games, if you extrapolate that for the entire season, those would have been a career numbers when it comes to touchdown passes. And so he's playing his best ball. He has great uh, – he's the culture of the team. There's confidence there. And you have a, an opportunity in the NFC North, and I get it, 
The Lions made the playoffs. They're surging. The Packers found their quarterback. But it's a division that's very winnable. You have your quarterback. Now's not the time to start over. Yeah, there's a lot about Minnesota that appeals to Kirk Cousins. Uh, not to mention, by the way, he's raising his family there. He and they like living there. Uh, I think that that is a very appealing destination. But as we have learned over the years with Kirk Cousins, the deal has to be right. And if they can't reach a deal uh, that makes both sides happy, then I do think they go their separate ways. This is going to unfold here in the coming weeks. They need to have this taken care of by the time his contract voids on March 13th, because at that point, $28.5 million of dead money hits their cap if they don't have an extension done with Kirk Cousins at that point. That would make it difficult for them to do the Jefferson deal. It would make them difficult to keep Daniil Hunter, defensive end, also eligible for free agency. So the Vikings have a lot of work to do, but the first thing they need to do is figure out if Kirk Cousins is going to be their quarterback or if they have to find some other solution there. You know, and back to Sam's point, he threw 18 touchdowns in those first eight games last year. That's the most he's ever had in the first eight games of a season in his entire career. So stay tuned there. Also, we are just getting back to NFL Live. We have Mel Kuyper's latest big board, which, as a reminder, ranks prospects according to their skill set, not by what teams need. This features three quarterbacks in the top five, Caleb Williams in the top spot, followed by Ohio State receiver Marvin Harrison Jr. C. Caden Daniels at number three. Uh, one of the most interesting questions, of course, is which quarterback the teams have after Caleb Williams. Mel does have Jaden Daniels over Drake May in this edition. Let's revisit the Heisman winning season for the LSU quarterback. My family, they find joy and peace, uh, you know, seeing me play football because, you know, they know they'll be proud of watching me go out there and play. I want to thank to every single LSU fan for having my back. I'm forever thankful. And he runs to the far side, 20, 25 outside the numbers to the 40. What a world to run across midfield. Cuts inside the 20. Touchdown. He'll launch towards the end zone. Touchdown. Fighting Tigers. Into the end zone. Touchdown. Fighting Tigers. They told me, uh, you know, no matter what, if I do something, you know, give it my all. So uh, every time I'm out there playing, I'm going to give it my all. You can say that you're Nigerian, and you are Nigerian. Like, I know, like, I am Nigerian, but you got to go back. You have to go back. All right, so, assuming that Caleb Williams is the first quarterback taken, Mikey T, and we saw last year how well that number two pick, C.J. Stroud, worked out for the Texans. Who are you taking? Are you taking Daniels or are you taking May? I'm taking Drake May, and I love Jaden Daniels. I think he's going to be really good. But when you consider the fact that Drake May lost Josh Downs and his 94 receptions, and we all know about Tez Walker, Hannah, and his eligibility issues, Drake May just didn't have a lot to work with. But prototypical size, really good athlete, can make all the throws, and didn't have a lot to work with. I don't think he played very well against Virginia, Georgia Tech. But I think when you're looking at someone that can withstand the rigors of an NFL season, all 17 games, to me, that's the tiebreaker with Jaden Daniels, who went to Arizona State at 108 pounds, who's gotten a lot better. But to me, if we were running a team, Hannah, one of the biggest questions is with 66 quarterbacks starting in 2023, which quarterback has a better chance of making it through the season? And to me, the answer is easy in that category. That's Drake May. No, I definitely hear what you're saying. I, I, and I lean Drake May as well. And I think the reason why is this. I look at the stats, not only the stats, right? I'm watching college football, watching Jane Daniels play. 40 passing touchdowns, 10 rushing touchdowns, Heisman Trophy, outstanding. Drake May didn't have as great of a season this year. But last year, what did Drake May do? 38 passing touchdowns, 7 rushing touchdowns. We so could do it with his arms, 45 total touchdowns to Jane Daniels, 50. He could do it with his arms and his legs as well. One thing I think about is this, the consistency of Drake May. And I'm not saying that Jane Daniels hasn't been consistent. What I am saying is that there's a huge uptick this season versus the last two seasons. So even, I, I remember last year, put it this way, just to kind of end it here. Last year, or I guess the year before last, when Drake May finished that season, if he would have been eligible, there was conversations about him being one of the top quarterbacks taken, yet he wasn't eligible last season. Now he is eligible. And so if you look at the oh, bigger picture, I'm still going Drake May over Jane Daniels, but Jane Daniels has surged up lists extremely fast. So I'm not saying he's two, maybe three to, to Caleb, or excuse me, Caleb Williams one, then I would go Drake May two, then I'd have Jane Daniels at three.
Yeah, and I think it's very much eye of the beholder, right? Quarterback evaluations in the NFL always are, particularly in the draft. If, if Mel Kuyper was drafting for the Washington Commanders, it sounds like he might take Jaden Daniels, but we don't know if that's the case uh, for Adam Peters and Dan Quinn. So we'll see. I think the concerns about the size, right? Mike T's talking about how slightly built Jaden Daniels is, and that's something that's going to make teams worry about his ability to sustain a long career. We did hear similar concerns about Bryce Young a year ago. Now, the concerns about Bryce Young were not could he perform at a high level in the NFL. It was could he last in the NFL at his size. And I think the latter will come up in discussions about Jaden Daniels because he's got that slight frame. But he's much taller than Bryce Young, and I think that gives him an edge performance-wise. The issues Bryce Young had performance-wise last year uh, were a lot more tied to situation, I think, than, than, his, uh, than his frame. But, yes, long-term, if, if teams are looking for a way to, say, break a tie, let's say we're, we're, we're really, you know, locked neck and neck between Drake May and Jaden Daniels, that's the kind of thing they could use. Yeah, it does feel like there's a little bit of perhaps recency bias uh, looking at Bryce Young. Like you mentioned, there's a lot of other factors behind, besides his size that played into him not having the kind of season that he wanted to, and certainly the least of which was not that C.J. Stroud completely outshone him at that number two pick. All right, guys, outside the quarterbacks, give me one person that you have your eye on. Mikey T. I'm going to go with Malik Neighbors, wide receiver LSU. Look, I love Marvin Harrison, Hannah. He's going to be a great player. He's like Larry Fitzgerald, but Malik, Malik Neighbors, he's Jalen Waddell. Over 15 yards per reception, massive game against Mississippi State. And if you're looking for a home run hitter, Malik Neighbors is that player in this year's draft. I think he's going to go with the top five even though he may not have the headlines of Marvin Harrison Jr. So one of the best inside linebackers in all of college football and draft prospects, I'm going Junior Colson, middle linebacker for Michigan. He started the last three years, 21 years old, and on the last three years, he's the one calling the play, signal caller. They have not been ranked lower than fifth in total defense. You say, well, they had all this talent. He has the keys to the car, the keys to the defense. <laughs> he asked for that when he meets with different coaches at, these, at the combine, et cetera. And so I'm looking forward to watching him play and maybe say late first round, but one of the top two or three inside linebackers taken this draft. Yeah, the guy wearing the dot. He has 257 tackles in those three seasons at Michigan, fourth most in the Big Ten. Okay, Dean rebounds, and Stephen A. just said they had a little bit of trouble stopping the Cowboys' pass rusher. Man, hey, what happened? Let me, listen, listen. I had C.J. Stroud can play. I had a couple of other cats that could play as well, but we had no answer for that damn sack master, Mike, Micah Parsons, who was allowed to step on the basketball court and treat men, women, and children like they were quarterbacks. Like they were opposing like, quarterbacks. Bird, Shannon Bird, Sharp Bird, was sitting up there, Bird, and they were knocking Bird, people all over Bird, the place. And Shannon, was, and Shannon was, was clapping them on. I mean, I got people in the hospital still recovering from Shannon, from Micah. <laughs> well, maybe if Stephen A. didn't warm up in his Louboutins and have a little trip to the hospital himself, he might have fared better. Uh, Sam, Sam, you played high school hoops, right, back in the day. What surprised you or impressed you the most? Well, I, I think the biggest thing is how... As a, as a high school athlete, I was thinking, man, I want to go to the NFL and play football. But how when I was getting recruited, my football coaches from college, they went to watch my high school basketball games. And so being a multi-sport athlete, being versatile, doing different things, some of the same skills you see on a football field, spin moves, great footwork, you see it on a basketball court as well. So what stands out to me is how some of the same skills translated from high school to college, the NFL, but also from one sport to another. Hey, thanks for leading me into our next topic here, and that would be Patrick Mahomes and his baseball background. We know that's been well documented and evidenced in his play on the football field from his sidearm throws to his shovel passes. His time as a shortstop definitely manifesting itself, but much lesser known. Mahomes basketball background at White House High School outside of Tyler, Texas. Tori Zawacki Roy explores that element of Mahomes' makeup. Oh, Sam, you know, you made a point earlier. So many of the elite, and I mean the very best Hall of Fame athletes, were all multi-sport players in high school. They played a lot of different sports, in particular basketball. How do you see that manifest itself with Mahomes? I see him allow his creativity to shine and to flourish anywhere he goes. As a football player, we always praise Patrick Mahomes for how creative, creative he is as a passer in the pocket, right? No-look passes. 
different arm angles. But the same type of things that you saw on the football field, we saw on the hardwood, the creativity, the spin move, the double spin move, spinning in the air and then getting the ball outlet to a teammate. And so for me, what sports does a great job of is allowing people to be creative, just like great artists or maybe just like great speakers, great writers. It allows them an avenue to show their stuff. And so that's what I love about watching guys like Patrick Mahomes or other guys who played. You see their talent, creativity, and skill not just in one lane. It's in many different avenues. Right. It allows that vision, right, in so many ways. All the processing that he does so quickly comes from all of that variety of existing offers for his house in Colorado.